In the waning months of 1918, the Imperial German High Seas Fleet sails into Scarpa Flow to surrender. The Grand Fleet of the Royal Navy basks in its victory. Its battle fleet is one of the most efficient instruments of sea power that has ever been created, and the morale of its officers and men is at its highest. Yet within a generation, this proud navy will be reduced dramatically. It will lose its aircraft, its sailors will mutiny, and it will face the most desperate conflict of its thousand-year history. A world war which, if lost, will not only mean defeat at sea, but the very destruction of Britain itself. May 1960. At the Battle of Jutland, under the command of Sir John Jellicoe, the dreadnoughts of the British Grand Fleet forced the German High Seas Fleet to retreat to their port. Though only a few German ships are sunk, the Kaiser's service fleet will never again seriously challenge the Royal Navy's command of the seas. By 1918, the Great War is over. The German fleet is finished. The Royal Navy reigns supreme. But even in victory, tensions and rivalries are tearing away at the fabric of triumph. The threat comes from a new direction, not from across the North Sea, but across the North Atlantic. Before she'd entered the war, the United States had declared itself in favor of possessing a Navy second to none. And that meant it was going to be as big as, if not bigger than, the Royal Navy. And the British viewed this with a certain amount of concern. When the British started planning their future fleet, the scenarios they took were wars with the United States, as it was the next biggest fleet. So there was a potential for a naval arms race between the United States and Britain. For Britain, this new naval race is unwanted and unaffordable. Exhausted by four grueling years of war, her treasury is empty. It's a watershed moment in British history. A nation which had always possessed a navy it felt was second to none, which in 1889 had passed a law mandating that her navy should be larger than the world's next two largest navies combined, was now willing to surrender supremacy without a fight. The American public, seeing no need for a peacetime naval buildup, also wanted to stop the race. In 1921, President Harding invited Britain, France, Italy, and Japan to Washington for a disarmament conference. The Washington Treaty process of 1921-22 tore the heart out of the British Empire. It was absolutely essential for the Royal Navy to be so powerful that the various outlying territories of the British Empire would be protected by the deterrent value of that almighty British fleet. The Washington process made that fleet too small to be a deterrent in the Mediterranean, the Far East, and Europe at the same time. Entire squadrons of dreadnoughts went to the wrecking yards. It was the greatest reduction of the Royal Navy in centuries. And that helped cap for at least 10 years a very potentially dangerous naval building race that could well have led to conflict. The Royal Navy did come away with one advantage. The British, although they have to scrap a lot of their existing ships, were going to have to scrap them anyway because they were obsolete. They are also allowed to build two new capital ships. The only nation in the world allowed to lay down and build two new capital ships in the 1920s. But for all the clever bargaining, one fact was unavoidable. For the first time in over 200 years, the Royal Navy would not be the largest in the world. More sacrifices were to come. During the crucible of World War I, the Royal Navy took to the skies. By war's end, the fleet commanded over a thousand aircraft, many of them soaring aloft from the decks of a new Royal Navy innovation, the aircraft carrier. Unfortunately, the decision was made at the end of the First World War that they would combine the Royal Naval Air Service with the Royal Flying Corps to produce uh, the Royal Air Force, which, uh, oddly enough, was formed on April the 1st, April Fool's Day. Major General Sir Hugh Trenchard became the first chief of the air staff. Fighting for his share of a shrinking budget, Trenchard viewed the Navy as a rival. Unfortunately, it took until 1924 to establish an official naval air arm. In an era when Lord Trenchard dominated the strategic debate with his bomber tactics, uh, the naval element suffered unduly, and we entered the Second World War with very small carriers 
and fairly antiquated biplanes. As the fleet shrank in the 1920s, so did its support structure. Shipyards closed, men with vital skills moved into other jobs. But even during this period of retrenchment in the Royal Navy, some progress was made. One of the most important advances was in the field of anti-submarine warfare. The most serious threat to Britain's capacity to move shipping across the oceans of the world, in general and the Atlantic in, in, in particular, throughout the war was the German submarine fleet. The British thought they had found the answer, an underwater detection device called ASDIC, named for the Allied Submarine Detection Investigation Committee. The Americans called it sonar. The device sent sound waves into the water that, when striking an object, would bounce back to the sending ship, revealing a submarine's position. Everyone all over the world overestimated the effectiveness of ASDIC, what we now call sonar, to deal with the submarine threat. By the late 1930s, Adolf Hitler had completely disregarded the treaty which had ended World War I and began rearming Germany. And Britain's military was in no position by itself to prevent Japan from invading huge areas of China. So as the World War II crisis begins to dawn in the mid to late 30s, we find the Italians, the Japanese and the Germans all beginning to think that Britain just isn't that powerful, that there's an opportunity, that they can secure their aims and that there's nothing the British can do. In 1937, the naval treaties disintegrated when Japan announced her withdrawal from the treaty system. In response, the British finally began to rearm. And in 1938, in particular, when the Germans are threatening to go to war, the British realize that they're at least a year behind the Germans. It would take time to repair the years of neglect, but time was running out. September 1939, war has come. For the next six years, the Royal Navy will have many missions, make many sacrifices, lose many men. But there is one challenge that will tower above all others from the first day to the last. Britain is an island that has to feed its people. Everything comes by ships. If the ships sink, Britain starves. In World War I, German submarines had nearly starved England into surrender. Now they were back, more modern, more savage, and with a lethal new tactic. The lone predators of World War I had become the vicious wolfpacks of World War II. We see almost the same pattern as we did in World War I. And of course, these losses begin to mount. The British activated convoys, groups of merchant vessels protected by escorting warships. But the lean years of peace had left the Royal Navy in a precarious situation. At the beginning of World War II, we simply didn't have enough escorts to protect the convoys. Another problem was that the U-boats usually mounted their attacks on the surface at night, thereby avoiding detection by sonar. However, one vital reinforcement had arrived. Winston Churchill, who had been first Lord of the Admiralty in World War I, returned to the same duty on the second day of World War II. And cometh the hour, cometh the man. He was exactly the right sort of personality to say, we're not going to lie down and take this. As long as there's life in us, we are going to fight. We will not be defeated in our island home. We will maintain our values. And as long as we've got life and fight and spirit in us, we will do it. When war began, two small German battleships were already at sea. In the South Atlantic, in the opening weeks of the war, the German Graf Spee destroyed 50,000 tons of merchant shipping. On December 13th, 1939, British Commodore Henry Harwood cornered the Graf Spee off the River Plate near the coast of Uruguay. Though Harwood's three cruisers were outgunned, his squadron finally wounded the Graf Spee, forcing her to retreat into the port of Montevideo. Graf Spee wasn't as powerful as propaganda would have it at the time. She was quite seriously damaged, superficially but nonetheless significantly. Uruguay was a neutral country, and international law limited the German ship's stay to 72 hours. Captain Langsdorff had gone into that battle thinking he was going to get a coronel, a major victory in South American waters. 
playing a bluff. The British transmitted stories that heavy reinforcements had arrived and were waiting just outside the harbor. Langsdorff took the bait. The German commander sailed out to sea, blew up his ship, and committed suicide. The Battle of the River Plate and the eventual scuttling of the Graf Spee demonstrated that the Royal Navy in this new war would have qualities it didn't have in the last. Qualities of aggression, qualities of, that would allow superior skill and expertise to make up for inferiority in materiel. On May 19, 1940, the German blitzkrieg smashed Holland, Belgium, and France. Within a week, 338,000 British and French troops found themselves trapped between the advancing Nazi army and the sea on the French beach of Dunkirk. They had to be evacuated or face certain annihilation. The Dunkirk evacuation is one of those things that the Royal Navy is very good at because it's been doing it for the last 400 years, that is, removing the army from the continent. Under the command of Admiral Sir Bertrand Ramsey, what was called the Mosquito Armada of lifeboats, tugs, yachts, barges and pleasure craft was pressed into service to aid the Navy fleet of 39 destroyers, seven sloops and 36 minesweepers. In all, 860 vessels took part in Operation Dynamo. For nine days, they endured the pounding of the Luftwaffe. Six of the destroyers were sunk and 19 more damaged. But in the end, the majority of the army was saved. The evacuation of the British Army from Dunkirk was a shattering blow to British morale. But it was also very quickly turned into a triumph. Dunkirk suddenly became a miracle. The fact that the British had lost a massive battle and been completely driven off the continent by a rampant German army suddenly disappeared. Meanwhile, as France fell, fascist Italy declared war on Great Britain. Though the Royal Navy was outnumbered by the Italians, it planned a bold attack to even the odds. On November 11, 1940, two waves of 21 aircraft launched from the British carriers Illustrious and Eagle. Their target? The main Italian fleet anchorage at Toronto. The plane struck in a deadly attack. In their wake, three battleships were lost and several lesser ships were damaged. The power of the aircraft carrier was clearly evident. And halfway around the world, Japan studied the raid with intense interest. For the Royal Navy, victories such as Toronto were welcome but fleeting. 1940 saw massive convoy losses to German U-boats and surface raiders in the North Atlantic. The fall of France allowed the German U-boats to get onto the west coast of France, from which it's an easy sail out into the Atlantic, where they started to be quite successful. In May of 1941, the giant new German battleship Bismarck attempted to break out into the convoy lanes. Stopping her was crucial. On May 24th, under the command of Vice Admiral Lancelot Holland, the new Prince of Wales and the battlecruiser Hood challenged the Bismarck in the Denmark Strait. Several minutes into the battle, disaster struck. Only three of the Hood's 1,500 men survived. Stunned and outraged, the British sought immediate revenge. Home Fleet Commander Admiral Sir John Toby quickly assembled a powerful task force to find and destroy the Bismarck. Running for the French port of Brest, Bismarck's rudder is disabled by hits from swordfish aerial torpedoes. Now, unable to control their ship, the Bismarck is overtaken and attacked by Toby's force. Three days after sinking the foot, the Bismarck is destroyed. Men who fought the First World War and went on to command in the Second World War were responsible for the Royal Navy being far more successful in World War II. Men like John Tovey ended up commanding the home fleet when they sank the Bismarck. The German surface fleet would never again challenge the Royal Navy in the North Atlantic. But the U-boats would. By December 1941, Britain had lost 1,299 merchant ships to the wolf packs. The elements of confusion at night in the Atlantic with darkened ships steaming in columns, a U-boat surfacing in the middle of it were enormous and the escorts dashing in and out trying to locate the exact position of a, of a marauding U-boat. 
Four million tons of vessels and desperately needed supplies were at the bottom of the sea. Churchill knew that Britain's greatest hope was bringing the United States into the war. The relationship between Churchill and Franklin D. Roosevelt is fascinating because Churchill shamelessly uses every opportunity to play up to Roosevelt because he needs American support. And he's trying at every opportunity to draw the Americans closer to the war. Then, on December 7, 1941, at Pearl Harbor, Japanese carrier aircraft turned the American fleet into an inferno. Three days later, off the coast of Malaysia, it was the Royal Navy's turn. The battleship Prince of Wales and the battle cruiser Repulse, sent to defend the British colony of Singapore, were attacked by large numbers of Japanese bombers. It was an execution. The question of aircraft versus battleships was open. The answer was on the ocean floor. Within weeks, Singapore fell, then Hong Kong. The Royal Navy was powerless to stop the Japanese advance. For the first time in history, it lost control of a theater of war and was not able to reclaim it. But the nightmare had just begun. Devonport Naval Base, Plymouth, a home for the Royal Navy since before the days of Sir Francis Drake, it remains today a vital base filled with naval activity. But during World War II, it paid the price as a strategic target for the Germans. I think anybody looking at our port cities, these are living uh, monuments to the sacrifice that has to be made during wartime. And of course, if you like the continuity that exists, it makes it worth fighting for. Plymouth was never as busy as in June 1944 when this harbor was jammed with ships and men poised for the greatest amphibious attack in history, D-Day. The Allied commander of the naval operations was Bertram Ramsey, the same man that conducted Operation Dynamo, the evacuation from Dunkirk. Now, almost exactly four years later, Ramsey was going back to France with a vengeance. But these ships and men would not be here if other battles had not been won. The first half of 1942 was a period of considerable crisis for the Royal Navy. The worst nightmare of the interwar planners had come to pass. We were fully committed against Germany in the Atlantic, we were fully committed against Italy in the Mediterranean, and we were fully committed against Japan in the Far East and the Indian Ocean. And we'd recognised we hadn't got the strength for two opponents, let alone three. With its resources already stretched to the breaking point, the Royal Navy undertook yet another responsibility, escorting vital convoys of merchant ships to the Soviet port of Murmansk on the Arctic Ocean. The most difficult and dangerous mission carried out by any navy in the Second World War was the passage of merchant shipping through to northern Russia. It was crucial that this be done, if for no other reason than to demonstrate politically the continued support of the British and the Western Allies in general to the Soviet cause. The Soviet army was the major individual instrument, as Churchill put it, tearing the guts out of the German army. The convoys in the Arctic Ocean would also be employed for another purpose. The Russian convoys could be used as bait for heavy German surface units based in Norway. The German Navy was about to take the bait. On December 26, 1943, Admiral Bruce Fraser in the battleship Duke of York engaged in a duel to the death with the German battlecruiser Scharnhorst. On Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, 1943, out comes the Scharnhorst and she is sunk by the flagship of the home fleet, supported by the cruisers and destroyers of the home fleet. But farther south in the Atlantic, the battle was not going well. In 1942, the Allied convoys bringing supplies from North America to England were taking terrible losses. The German wolf packs, under the command of Admiral Karl Dönitz, were starving Britain out of the war. For the Allies, Britain's survival was vital from which to launch the liberation of Europe. The Battle of the Atlantic is the longest and most complex battle of the Second World War. It lasts from the first day to the last. If the Allies can communicate across the oceans, they can move men and supplies to the places they need them. If they can't use the oceans, they'll be isolated, they'll be picked off, and they'll lose. So the Battle of the Atlantic is about winning the war. 
The man who would challenge the U-boat menace was an aloof, hard-driving, and efficient British admiral named Max Horton, the same man who had gained fame as a submarine ace in World War I. In November 1942, sinkings had risen to over 800,000 tons. But Horton was convinced the U-boats could be beaten. A man with that ruthless streak, that determination to win, and an understanding of what made submariners tick. Horton understood that if he killed enough German U-boat personnel, the U-boats would no longer be effective. British codebreakers, in a highly secret operation named Ultra, gave Horton the weapon he needed. They had broken the German naval code. With this advantage, Horton was often able to either route convoys out of danger or bait Dernitz wolf packs into traps. In the days before we knew about Ultra, it was said because of his submariner's instinct, he was able to know what the Germans were doing. We now know it wasn't so much instinct, it was the decrypts, etc. But by March of 1943, it seemed even Ultra would not be enough. Merchant ship sinkings reached nearly 700,000 tons. A campaign like the Battle of the Atlantic, you often think you're losing when you're winning. You're sinking a lot of the enemy, but you're losing a lot yourself. Then, as if by a miracle, sinkings began to drop, and U-boat losses soared. Horton's efforts were finally paying off. And then we were set for the great showdown in the Battle of the Atlantic in 1943, when a, a hugely enlarged German submarine force smashes itself against heavily escorted convoys. The climax would come in April. Max Horton, taking up the gauntlet, deliberately sends 40 merchant ships and eight escorts of convoy ONS-5 into harm's way. On a single night in May, 31 of Dernitz U-boats strike relentlessly. 12 merchant ships are sunk, but at a cost of six U-boats. In April and May 1943, Horton sank 90 U-boats. His forces broke the back of the German U-boats to such an extent that even their commander, Admiral Dernitz, was forced to withdraw them from the Atlantic and the U-boats were never again a threat. With the U-boat menace finally eliminated, the massive build-up of supplies and men in England for the invasion of Europe is successfully completed. For the invasion, Admiral Bertrand Ramsey assembled the largest fleet ever seen. 6,833 ships of all kinds were off Normandy on the morning of June 4, 1944, poised to blast through the door of Fortress Europe. There's firepower of every description, 15 and 16-inch heavy naval guns, right down to 4.7-inch guns in converted landing craft for close-in fire support. Every possible opportunity the Royal Navy took to support those troops and get them onto the beach with the least casualty and the greatest opportunity. The invasion was a stunning but costly success. A little over a year later, the defeated Germany lay in ruins. The Royal Navy was now free to return to the Pacific to support the United States, whose Navy had been beating back the Japanese since the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. The Pacific was a carrier war. The Royal Navy soon found that American naval aviation was far more advanced. American carriers had nearly three times the number of aircraft. But there was one area where the British carriers were clearly superior. When our armored hangar carriers went across to the Pacific and were attacked by kamikazes, it was found that they could sustain hits by kamikaze aircraft much better than American carriers could. But the kamikazes were the Japanese Empire's last gasp. In August of 1945, they joined the Third Reich in the junkyard of history. From the beginning to the end, the Royal Navy's war had been grueling, its losses in men and ships high. Yet the fleet had succeeded in every important mission. The U-boats had been beaten, the Mediterranean stayed open, and Russia had been supplied. But there was one vital difference between the triumphant victories of World Wars I and II. Britannia no longer ruled the waves, that crown had passed to the far larger United States Navy. The Royal Navy would soon find itself in a new battle for existence, threatened not only by new technology and a hostile Soviet empire, but by its own government. The 
The Royal Navy of the 21st century is as different from the Navy of 1945 as that Navy was from Horatio Nelson's wooden ships of the land. These amazing changes, which will see the gun replaced by the missile, piston aircraft supplanted by jets, and the introduction of atomic power were part of a vast revolution. For the Royal Navy, the road from then to now would be a rocky one. The Royal Navy ended the Second World War as it ended all of its previous wars, far larger, far more professional, far more competent, far more flexible than it began it. But unlike every previous war, it was no longer the world's greatest navy. It was now very much the second navy in a world where there were only two navies. The Americans had the biggest, the British had the next, and nobody else had a navy of any consequence at all. In April 1949, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was formed by the United States and Western Europe. It was a military alliance against the burgeoning menace of the Soviet Union. Yet the Soviet bloc was not the only foe faced by the Royal Navy. Lord Trenchard, father of the Royal Air Force, believed atomic weapons made traditional wars a thing of the past. He told the House of Lords that Hundreds of millions could be saved by scrapping carriers and overseas bases, relying instead on the long-range atomic armed bombers of the RAF. It's when you get the advent of the H-bomb, which can deliver cataclysmic blows against the home base, that people do begin to ask very serious questions about, well, what's the point of escorting convoys to feed people who are already dead? But when war did break out, it would be traditional and beyond the range of Trenchard's bombers. June 25th, 1950, six divisions of the North Korean People's Army swarmed across the 38th parallel, the border between North and South Korea. At first, the only effective way to slow them down was to hit them from the air. On July 3rd, American and British carriers launched the first of thousands of airstrikes against the North Koreans until Allied ground troops could halt the Red Advance and establish airfields, the carriers would have to shoulder the air war. One of the major British contributions to the Korean War was a naval one. Operating aircraft carriers, cruisers, destroyers around the coast of Korea, making sure the Koreans couldn't use the seaward flank. So Korea is very much a naval war. By the end of the fighting in July 1953, the Royal Navy had flown over 23,000 sorties. Although the Royal Navy fought Korea with its slower but rugged propeller planes, jets were already going to sea. After the war, the British face a serious difficulty. Their carriers are too small for contemporary aircraft. Therefore, we have to make some pretty radical developments. To launch the heavier jets, the Royal Navy hit upon the idea of using steam from the carrier's boiler to power catapults. To ensure safe landings at the jet's higher speeds, they also devised a system of mirrors and lights called the mirrored landing site that allowed a pilot to monitor his own approach. And by angling the flight deck only a few degrees relative to the ship's centerline, they found that the forward part of the flight deck could be used for parking and launching aircraft, while the angled portion of the deck could be used for landings and other launches. Angling also significantly increased the area of the deck, making it easier for the heavier jets to operate. Because of this, the British take the lead with the angled deck, the mirror landing aid, which allow our small carriers to operate jets and allow American carriers to operate jets even better and to get even more potential out of their larger carriers. In 1954, America launched the USS Nautilus, the world's first atomic submarine. In war games with the US and Royal Navy, Nautilus was subjected to 5,000 dummy attacks and was sunk only three times. So USS Nautilus comes across the Atlantic and scares the pants off every anti-submarine warfare specialist in the Royal Navy. The only way we can deal with a nuclear-powered submarine is to have a nuclear-powered submarine of our own. The energetic first Sea Lord, Admiral Louis Mountbatten, quickly recognized this urgent fact but designing a nuclear reactor from scratch would take years. Mountbatten had another solution. He then goes to the United States and uses every uh, charm 
every ounce of mendacity he could bring to bear in order to charm and con Rickover, the American nuclear submarine chief, into selling us a nuclear reactor. On Trafalgar Day, 1960, Queen Elizabeth launched Britain's first atomic submarine, HMS Dreadnought. The historic name demonstrated her importance. As a result of another American development, atomic submarines would soon give the Royal Navy another vital mission. In 1962, President Kennedy offered British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan the Polaris missile, a long-range ICBM that could be fired from a submerged submarine. Uh, Macmillan says, hell yes, or something equivalent. And within weeks, the Nassau Agreement is signed in December 1962, which transferred Polaris technology to the UK. But many wondered what role this new nuclear navy would play in a world in which the sun was setting on the once mighty British Empire. In 1947, India, the jewel in Queen Victoria's crown, became independent. In 1948, South Africa, Ceylon, and Burma went the same route. By 1953, the Royal Navy had fallen to third place behind the United States and an expanding Soviet Navy. In 1967, in response to these new realities, the Ministry of Defense produced a strategic review that gutted the Navy. It called for giving up all commitments east of Suez and the elimination of every carrier in the fleet. The aircraft carrier program had been the centerpiece of the strike capability of the surface fleet. Take away that centerpiece, then you don't have the offensive capability, which is a vital component of any Navy. But there was hope, and it came in the form of a remarkable new aircraft called the Harrier. Able to take off and land like a helicopter, this amazing jet fighter did not need a conventional flight deck. The Navy was in the process of designing a new helicopter cruiser named the Invincible. The Invincible class carriers had their genesis as successors to the cruisers of the fleet, not the aircraft carriers. However, they had greatness thrust upon them because of the decision in 1966 not to go ahead with a new class of 50,000 ton proper aircraft carriers. Suddenly, therefore, they became the main air-capable vessels of the fleet and therefore potential small aircraft carriers. To avoid alarming the government, the Royal Navy now referred to these vessels as through-deck cruisers. But even these ships weren't safe from the acts of another cost-cutting administration. In 1981, Margaret Thatcher's defense minister announced that one of only three Invincible-class carriers would be sold to Australia. The number of frigates and destroyers would be cut to 42. In 1981, the British government decided that as it was a NATO nation and its, all its commitments were within the NATO area, it didn't need a large open ocean Royal Navy. It was also decided that the Navy's Antarctic Ice Patrol ship Endurance would be withdrawn. This seemingly insignificant action would soon engulf the Royal Navy in its largest campaign since World War II. The old Royal Naval College, Greenwich, May 23rd, 2001. His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, dedicates the Lewin Gate in honor of deceased Admiral of the Fleet, Sir Terence Lewin. Lewin was Chief of Defense Staff in 1982 when his attentions were turned to a small group of rocky islands off the coast of Argentina. British involvement dated back to 1690, but Argentina also claimed these islands which they call the Malvinas. When one looks at the origins of the Falklands War, I think one important factor in the perceptions of the Argentinians was that the British, A, were not interested in the Falklands anymore, symbolized by the decision to withdraw HMS Endurance. If we weren't willing to base an ice patrol ship in the islands, were we really willing to fight for them? Argentina's leaders, a military junta, had been rapidly losing political control. A bold move was needed to regain the nation's support. On April 2nd, 1982, they invaded the Falklands. Within hours, the British government decided to fight for the islands. On April 5th, 
the people of Portsmouth turned out in thousands to see the fleet sail into harm's way. I don't believe the Argentinians expected the Britons to dispatch a task force to retake the island so soon. Aboard one of the ships was 22-year-old Prince Andrew, a Sea King helicopter pilot. It was the largest Royal Navy operation since World War II. The prospects were daunting. The fleet had to sail 8,000 miles, defend against Argentina's Navy and Air Force, and land enough troops to eject the enemy from the Falklands. There was also another threat to overcome. I think what people generally forget about the Falklands, it's a very hostile place. And when we went down there one day in three, it was more than uh, wind force seven. There's no question about that, with very high seas. And that has a, a wearing effect both on the people and on the ships and aircraft that are operating around the Falklands. On Sunday morning, April 25th, the Argentine submarine Santa Fe is spotted off Cumberland Bay by Lieutenant Commander Stanley's helicopter. His observer, Lieutenant Chris Perry, immediately drops two depth charges. One of them bounced off his casing, the other one dropped in the water alongside, and the whole back end of the submarine blew out of the water, uh, and a propeller fell off, and his rudders were bent. Disabled and taking on water, the Santa Fe struggled back to port. By noon, she was abandoned alongside the jetty at King Edward Point. The carrier battle group arrived on the 1st of May. The first major naval engagement took place the next day. The nuclear-powered attack submarine HMS Conqueror was trailing the Argentine cruiser General Belgrano, which is the USS Phoenix, had originally belonged to the United States Navy. The USS Phoenix had been the only major ship to escape from Pearl Harbor when it was attacked by the Japanese in 1941. As she headed for the Falklands, it was decided that the Belgrano had to be stopped. On May 2nd, the British submarine Conqueror fired three torpedoes. Two found their mark. Within an hour, the Belgrano had sunk. Once the Belgrano was sunk by HMS Conqueror, then it was clear to the Argentines that they could not operate in the vicinity of British nuclear-powered attack submarines. So therefore, they had to put into port. Though the Argentine fleet was out of action, the air forces were not. But the outnumbered Harriers proved devastating. Of the over 100 Argentine losses, they destroyed over 30. Yet not one of the fleet's 24 Sea Harriers was shot down in air-to-air -air combat. But the war had taken a heavy toll on both sides. The Argentines had lost the Belgrano, the Santa Fe, six patrol vessels and over 1,000 dead. The British had lost four ships to airstrikes. 255 men were killed in action, with over 750 wounded. By June 14th, the war was over. The irony was that if Argentina had waited for the planned fleet reductions, the British would probably have been unable to counterattack. The Argentine invasion of the Falkland Islands was a godsend for the Royal Navy. It demonstrated to the politicians in a way that we have to hope they haven't yet forgotten, that the Royal Navy is essential to the maintenance of British global interests. Since the Falklands, new Royal Navy ships have been designed and launched. We also plan to procure two new large aircraft carriers, returning really to our roots, uh, which ended uh, in the late 1970s. It will give us the ability uh, to send air power anywhere in the world that can be touched uh, by the sea. Today, the Royal Navy plays a vital role in NATO and remains a strong ally of the United States. On October 7, 2001, when the U.S. fired the first rounds in the war on terrorism, cruise missiles were launched into Afghanistan from Royal Navy submarines. Open four, five, and six main vents. Open four, five, and six main vents. But a fleet is not just ships and aircraft, it's people. At the Britannia Royal Naval College at Dartmouth, cadets are first introduced to the rigorous challenges of modern naval warfare. Nobody knows until they get into battle whether they'll be able to deal with it or not. But the best way to prepare people is to put them under pressure in peacetime so it doesn't come as a surprise when they're in combat. And if you can make training as close to combat as possible, then you will replicate the skills 
you will suppress the fears that people will naturally have in the face of the enemy or in the face of the unexpected. People think you can lay down rules for combat, for war. It isn't like that. You can train them, you can give them as much experience as you like, but that can only be the springboard from which you allow them to leap into the sea of initiative. And we really must train people to fight the first day of the next war, not fight the last day of the previous one. Okay. But while the Royal Navy keeps one eye on the future, it also makes sure that its officers and crews never lose sight of its proud history. First, so we move to turn away from him. To join the Royal Navy, you're joining a service that hasn't lost a major war for 300 years. And there isn't another armed force anywhere in the world that can claim that. If you look at the oceans of the world today, you'll find the Royal Navy in all of them. And if there's a puddle, frankly, anywhere in the world, I hope you'll continue to find an Englishman afloat on it. For over 500 years, the Royal Navy has guarded this island nation and its way of life. Whether the threat was the galleons of Spain, the ships of Napoleon, or the hordes of Nazi Germany, she has drawn a line that warned this far and no further. The long reach of this legendary force has been a sword at the throat of enemies and a comforting shield to friends. As sail and wood became steam and steel, the soul of this Navy has remained vigilant for now and for always. Though the Royal Navy of this century looks nothing like Nelson's great ships of the line or the giant steel dreadnoughts of Jackie Fisher, at the dawn of the 21st century, it still commands respect as a vital presence in both Britain and around the world. In today's circumstances, the Royal Navy's fighting power or ability to project power ashore can be brought to bear at a time and place of political choice to over 100 nations. The Royal Navy is ready today for the unforeseen challenges of tomorrow.